think a really exciting day today. A lot of good technical talks and uh, I think a little sizzle in some of these technical talks too. But the, the first one is Kyle Wilhoit of Trend Micro. He's going to be talking about a virus in your pipes, SCADA malware, and its increasing prominence. Kyle is a threat researcher at Trend Micro, Trend Micro on the future threat research team. He focuses on original threats and malware. He also actively tracks crimeware and mar targeted malware-based espionage worldware. He's basically the ICS malware guy. So I, I wanted him to come here and talk about that. So please welcome Kyle Wilhoit. All right, thanks for the uh, very nice introduction. So what are we gonna be talking about today? Everybody always talks about Stuxnet. Always, everyone always talks about all of this malware that's going around and, and affecting ICS devices. Well, the intention of this talk is to actually take it a little bit higher and look at this from a higher level and start to understand what's happening, why it's happening, and what this could, um, in terms, affect. So first, I'm going to go ahead and talk about who am I. Dale already kind of alluded a little bit to this. Uh, senior threat researcher, uh, Trend Micro. I was previously at FireEye, where I was an intel analyst, primarily working on state-sponsored attacks, uh, criminal espionage worldwide, et cetera, anything that you would associate with FireEye. Um, right now, I focus on, as you can see, threat intelligence, state-sponsored uh, attacks, um, and offensive security. And spoken at several conferences, et cetera. So what are some of the threats to SCADA in the past 12 months? I know a lot of us are already familiar with this, and I know a lot of us already know this. But what were some of them from a high level directly related to malware? Because again, this is what I'm focusing on today, is malware. First, there's Blacken. I refer to it as Blacken, and Trend Micro refers to it as Blacken. It's otherwise known as Black Energy, right? It's SCADA-centric in its victimology, for the most part, and in relation to how Blacken is working, it's actually targeting GE Intelligent, the Simplicity HMI. So that's what it's looking for specifically. It can be weaponized in different versions, et cetera, but the version that I'm going to be discussing today is primarily against Simplicity. Then there's Havix which is really the first publicized malware to actively scan OPC servers. So if any of you out there are using OPC, this is going to be a pretty big one, and I'm actually going to go down and break out OPC and start to look at this. So malware with SCADA over the years, it's pretty simple, right? Pretty self-explanatory. 2010, one sample, I think we all know what that is. And it kind of goes throughout the year, with 2014 being uh, pretty well the most important year, because this is where Black Energy and Havoc started to come into play. And I'm also today going to be discussing uh, the criminal aspect behind um, SCADA malware as well. And so really this could be above two, just because of some of the criminal aspects that I'm gonna be discussing, but two well-publicized uh, pieces of malware that have really come out and were prominent in 2014. So here's a rough vulnerability count. Realistically, the big piece behind this is in 2014, there was over 900 vulnerabilities that were presented within the SCADA environment. What does this mean directly to malware? This is actually fantastic if you're a malware writer. It means that you're going to have more vulnerabilities to be able to introduce into the environment and to be able to exploit to be able to then drop malware into the environment. So this is good for an actual um, individual writing malware, it's perfect. So why would these particular attackers use malware? First of all, it's easy, right? I mean, we see that every day across the board. Malware is easy to use, it's easy to weaponize, and it's easy to get someone to click on something. It's a gateway into the rest of the environment, right? It allows you to get access, it allows you to get a foothold into that environment, and then start to go from there and laterally move, move into other places within the environment, um, and criminalize, in some aspects, uh, some of that particular, whatever that mission is. And also, as we just saw on the last slide, there's a tremendous amount of vulnerabilities, which makes it easier to exploit. So let's get right into the actual malware side. There was a group that I'm sure a lot of you have heard about because it, it was, uh, be became quite big in the news called Sandworm. This is the particular group of individuals that is said to be behind a specific attack. Who were these particular individuals? They were brought to light by EyeSight, 
a great threat intel company. They were brought to light by that particular company in a great report. I highly recommend, if you haven't read that, to go out and actually read through that report. This particular group was targeting SCADA systems directly. It showed some sort of reconnaissance work for future attacks at the very beginning of their attack chain. It's supposedly Russian in origin. I'm not going to get into the attribution piece behind that, but it's, supposed, uh, it, it, it's supposedly Russian. Also, uh, it has been confirmed that uh, certain CVE, in this case, 2014-0751 was used in the actual exploitation or the, getting into the environment. And it supposedly used drive-by scanning, looking for HMI machines that were facing the internet and that were actively exposed. And again, they're looking for generic security issues that are occurring in these environments. It's nothing new, unfortunately. So who did these guys target? First of all, they've been active since 2009, so these guys didn't just pop up overnight. They've been active since 2009, and over the years, they've targeted uh, Ukrainian government organizations, particularly um, focused on NATO, Western European government operations and organizations, energy sector firms, and in one case, this was specifically uh, occurring within Poland, European telecommunications firms, academic organizations. So they've attacked a wide variety of organizations as well as a wide variety of uh, public institutions, et cetera. So Black Energy, the campaign itself, this particular campaign was utilizing Black Energy, which was originally developed as a crimeware tool. It's fairly generic in nature, but it's become increasingly more complex over the past three years or so. Multiple versions exist, all three of which are fairly widely distributed and fairly widely used as well. So Black Energy, Black Energy 2, and Black Energy 3. Those are the three iterations of this malware. It slowly started to migrate from what we would consider a banking trojan into more targeted attacks, which we're going to see here in a few minutes. It utilizes a plug-in functionality, making it very, very modular. This is the dangerous aspect behind black energy in relation to the actual sandworm operation. Whenever I say it's utilizing plug-in functionality, we're going to get into some of that, and I'm actually going to discuss some of those plugins that were actually being utilized because they were specifically oriented to SCADA. And whenever I say that, I mean it's doing port scanning, looking for specific ports, et cetera. We'll get into some of that here shortly. Starting in around mid-2013, we saw evidence of targeted attacks utilizing black energy against some of the energy sector. And again, we'll get into some of that. And in this case, the Sandworm team operated and used a modified version of black energy 2 and black Ener energy 3. Why were these particular individuals looking at ICS environments? First, was it economic espionage? We don't really know. We can formulate hypotheses and hypotheses all day, but we don't actually know what the purpose is behind that. It's just like performing attribution against an attacker. We don't necessarily know why they were doing it. The second piece is easy entry point, meaning they could enter the environment and then possibly laterally move and find another place to go into the environment and actually go out and find the real target or the real opportunity that they're looking for um, at a later date. Or lack of knowledge, right? So they may not even know. It's very highly unlikely at this point because it was so targeted and it was very advanced and SCADA specific, but still, it's still something to, to bring up. So where does this all kind of blend together? You have Sandworm and you have the actual ICS piece. All of that comes together with simplicity, right? Whenever we were going out and looking, me and another researcher, Jim, who's actually right over there. Jim, raise your hand. There he is. I just wanted to embarrass Jim. <coughs> um, we pivoted off the IOCs found in the iSight report, and we started to go a little bit further, and we saw that this particular team was utilizing .sim files. I'm sure all of you are familiar with what a .sim file is. That automatically piqued our interest and said, okay, what exactly is going on? You know, this is obviously being utilized in simplicity, so what's going on? There are really two main components behind this. And this diagram should help kind of characterize and visualize what this is. You have devlist.sim, and then you have config.back. And we're going to dive into this a little bit in, in a little bit more detail here shortly. 
But you can see the really important parts are the plugins. So if you look down on the bottom, you'll see the plugin arrows. What those plugins are doing are, again, bringing in the modular aspect behind these actual attacks and allowing those uh, attackers to be able to say, okay, we only want to use this plugin or this plugin at certain times, or we want to keep it lean, so we'll only deploy it with one plugin, et cetera. And we'll go again into each of these pieces in greater detail. So config.back, what was that? This is realistically one of the, the more interesting uh, files that we saw. It was specifically designed to execute the actual black energy payload and to actually bring that payload down. So it actually saves the file. And then the interesting strings part is what we actually found in that file. You can see the actual C2, which is no longer active, obviously. This has been since like October of last year. So this is no longer active, so don't go out and try to nail it or anything. It's not going to do anything. Um, but those are the interesting strings. So they didn't take a lot of time to obfuscate any of their strings in their code, so it made it really easy for us to be able to go out then and find the files on that server, et cetera. Then default text. This is what was copied from the C2, and it executes an actual flash player app.exe. At that point, it then deletes itself, and it's capable of issuing several commands. And you can see these are all just specific commands that are related to this file that allow you to do control of the system, allows you to do multiple things, look at processes, execute commands, et cetera. Devlist.sim. So you can see we start to hop over now to the other side, or the other main component of this particular operation. This opens immediately after execution. So you just double click on it, opens up. Category XML is downloaded from that particular file. There's a file that's created beyond that, one step further. And black energy is ultimately dropped with the interesting name of simwrap pnps.exe. So again, you're starting to see some of that targeted nature, some of that knowledge um, of SCADA environments or ICS environments coming about. Once that's pulled down, it executes and then deletes itself immediately. Let's get into the plugins piece. This is the interesting part. So you can see, again, this is the diagram. The plugins sitting below are the modular aspect, the pieces that can get then plugged in and executed elsewhere. They're used for modular functionality, meaning that they can very quickly and in, in, in a very thin format be able to deploy this malware and have it very small so it doesn't get bloated, it doesn't get huge, it doesn't have to execute 100 different files. It keeps only the wanted features implemented in the actual files themselves. So it keeps only the features that they want if it's targeted for a specific campaign. SS.dll, this is the first plugin that was noticed. It's a screenshot and capture tool. Why they were interested in having this, I don't know. Unfortunately, I didn't fly to the particular country of origin to start asking the writers of this to find out why they were interested in that. It takes in three specific arguments. Realistically, these arguments are what you would expect. Screenshot time, um, as well as video recording time, and a sleep function, so it allows you to execute how long would you like it to sleep before turning on the camera, turning off the camera, taking a screenshot, et cetera. This is the first piece of plugin, and a lot of times, keep in mind that we were seeing these plugins not just utilized on one aspect, so it wasn't just necessarily one plugin being utilized, it was a multitude of one. So it was three, four, maybe two of the plugins were being utilized. So they were all used in conjunction, and they were all used um, in a multiple type of format. Scan.dll. This is one that I'm going to actually show a video of um, actually executing here shortly. It's a packet capture and storage tool, very similar to Nmap, nothing too crazy there. But it's interesting that they had it as a packaged plugin. That's what makes it interesting. VS.dll. It's a plugin used for spreading network shares via network shares. So it hops from network share to network share via this plugin. It uses a sys internals tool. And we see a lot of tool reuse, and I'm going to show that a little bit later as well. But there's a lot of tool reuse, because in their mind, why recreate the wheel? Right? You might as well use something that works. And then it also enumerates drives, shares, credentials, anything that you would be able to then laterally move from. So it starts to enumerate those particular uh, pieces of information. 
cert.dll. It looks for native certs on the system itself. From there, it looks for certs only that were added by the user. So keep that in mind. Because then it shows, OK, this is of importance, right? It's saying this cert is important. It's added by the user. It sends the, say, the actual data of the certs back to the C2. So it doesn't actually try to do any offloading of the certs. It doesn't do anything like that. It actually just sends the data back about it. Now we're going to jump over and talk about another group that a lot of you are probably familiar with, a group called Crouching Yeti. I know a lot of you have probably heard about this again because it's utilizing Havix, which is another piece of malware. What is Havix? First of all, it's a simple PHP rat. It's very, very simple. There's not a lot behind it, and it's easy to use and operate. It's used very heavily in the Crouching Yeti campaign, and I'm going to just start calling them Drunk Yeti just because it's fun, and I don't really have any other particular reason behind it. Infection vectors. There's three realistic infection vectors. First, spear phished email, right? The common targeted attacker methodology, nothing crazy there. Trojanized software and watering hole attacks. These were all utilized in 2014, so we have witnessed all three of these, um, these infection vectors being utilized last year. So first, let's look at the actual Trojanized software. These are actual screenshots of two of the Trojanized packages. And just for demo purposes, let's see if the play button works. No? Can you play the video, please? This is just an example, and this is the actual malware that's being run. So you can see that it's very, very, um, to a normal user, they would have no clue that it would be doing anything nefarious. So keep that in mind. This is the actual malware. Um, that's executing. And I'm not showing this because it's going to come up and say, oh, I'm infected, this is awesome. It's literally just installing. So keep that in mind. But it's, I'm trying to showcase at this point that it's very easy to hide this type of malware into a Trojanized app. So keep that in mind. So that's the first infection vector. The second is watering holes. I don't, again, I have some weird thing. Last night at 1 in the morning, I was just looking through pictures, and I found funny stuff that related to this, so I put that up there. Um, and it looks like a watering hole in some regard, I guess. So this is a screenshot of the actual site. Um, and you can obviously see who it is. And from this, they were utilizing a Lights Out exploit kit. Lights Out is a very common exploit kit, not that advanced, uh, fairly run of the mill. What makes this somewhat interesting is that there were multiple vulnerabilities that were actually exploited. And I included the list there um, in case any of you want that. I, have, I can provide you with that list um, afterwards or the slides I'm going to make public as well. So if you want that list of actual vulnerabilities, I'll have that publicly available. Um, what makes it somewhat lame, though, is that it's using modified Metasploit Java exploits, which, I mean, it's either they're doing it because it's easy or they're doing it because they're lazy, one of the two. Probably the latter. And then the third is spear phishing. <laughs> this is one of those late night funny pictures. <laughs> and creepy too. So, <laughs> really creepy. I saw that and I debated because I didn't want people to be like, what the hell is this guy's deal? <laughs> so, um, spear phishing again, there's nothing outrageously different here either, right? The common technique for these targeted attackers to utilize utilizes a PDF uh, vulnerability and I included it up there. Go out and search virus total for that CVE and you'll see a lot of really fun stuff if you're interested in such things. Ultimately, shell code's executed from the spearfish, which ultimately gives the attacker command or control of that particular system. Again, nothing too crazy here. What does the attack lifecycle of Crouching Yeti look like? I figured it was best to try to visualize this just because there are several steps that the attackers took during this time. So first, they would grab the contacts from Outlook, which was interesting. This was one of the first times that you had really start to see them grabbing contacts in the fashion in which they did. From there, they did a sys information grab on that particular native system that they were on. From there, they then performed OPC scanning. They didn't just do it on the system that they were at. They also did it across whatever network that they were present on. Whatever network they could reach, they would laterally scan. And they were doing that, obviously, to look for OPC servers. And then they did password dropping and credential harvesting. And then finally, they did exfiltration. 
So it's fairly common, and what we're seeing here is a fairly common targeted attack technique. The steps are fairly common with the difference of OPC and SCADA scanning. So first, let's look at the actual OPC scanning module. This is the most important part, or most interesting part. I actually have a lab out in my car that I flew in, but there's not enough time for me to execute all this. If you want to see it afterwards, I'll bring it in, and we'll set it up, and we'll run all this malware. I have it all with me. Uh, we'll execute all of it against the lab if you want. I just don't have enough time, unfortunately, to do it right now. So I made videos last night in between all the creepy pictures that I found. OK, so can we go ahead and play this video? This is the actual scanning module in action as it goes through. So you can see, first of all, that I'm executing the DLL. It just pipes out through run DLL, so nothing crazy there. As it executes, you can see it create a few files. The interesting ones are on the desktop, and we'll, I'm going to show those in a second. This is the result directly of the scanner. So you can see as it's going through. Now keep in mind, well, let me go back. So this is the actual interesting stuff. It does two text file dumps. The first is OPC server one and OPC server two. That contains the actual information for any servers that it finds, as well as pulling down tags, anything it can grab, that's where it dumps that data. Keep in mind that all of these files that you're looking at to an operator would not see them because they get deleted or they get exfilled. So keep that in mind. Or in these particular cases, they actually get encrypted as YLS files. So if you're not looking for those and you don't know how to decrypt the files necessarily, you're going to have a harder time trying to find out what's in those files. So it's a little bit hard for operators to see those. And oftentimes, it'll just kind of go under the radar. So it's harder to find. Now we'll jump over to the actual password dropper and credential harvester. Again, nothing crazy here. We've all seen tools like this. But this is the exact tool that they used. And it shows you they didn't recreate the wheel. They just re they utilized a tool that already existed. Can we go ahead and play it then? Um, again, this is simple. What I'm showing right here is just a fake email account. So if you guys go out and try to log into this account, it doesn't exist. So don't try to go out and log in, because it's not going to do anything. So this is the tool that they use, exact hash given, everything like that. Browser password decryptor. This is an old school tool. It just pulls down credentials from multiple browsers, multiple systems. And then you can actually do a recovery of those systems, and it shows the password clearly right there. So this is what allows them to do some lateral movement as well. Pretty simple. Again, not cre recreating the wheel, but it allows them to be lazy. They can just take this tool, download it, execute it, nothing crazy. So now we're going to talk about trojanized software, the actual software that we saw um, as it's been coming about. I don't know if that horse is photoshopped or not, but I don't know. It was cool. <laughs> so what is this trojanized SCADA software? I'm going to admit that whenever um, I had started to find some of this stuff, I wasn't really that impressed with it. It's just it was crimeware, right? Um, but then as I started to look into it a little bit more, it became more interesting just because of the relative nature that it was using naming conventions traditionally found uh, within SCADA environments, uh, be behind applications, et cetera. So that's whenever it started to become more interesting. Uh, this is classified as crimeware based on what we were seeing, based on the behaviors it was, it was exhibiting. So keep that in mind, that this is classified as crimeware. And the last two points are very important, because I've been contacted by a lot of individuals over the past uh, week, really spun up, thinking that this could be black energy. Unless this is a black energy that I've never seen, or that Trend Micro has never seen, it's not black energy. Keep that in mind. I'm not going to, if it comes out and it's black energy, everybody's going to, oh, you said it wasn't black energy. Yeah, I don't, what I have the data on, it's not black energy. So this shows some experience and knowledge within SCADA. Or they're proficient at Googling, and they're just targeting SCADA because of its relative ease in entry into the environment. So it shows some sort of experience or the ability to do Googling, one of the two. We noticed three different targets, realistically. There was WinCC, Advantech, and Simplicity. All of us are familiar with that. I'm not going to go into great detail. 
the samples that we ascertained were from open source intelligence as well as intelligence that we have within our organization. Everything that I polled was from China or Taiwan. Again, I'm not getting into attribution because that can, that can happen in multiple different fashions, so I'm not going to get into attribution. That was just an interesting point of correlation. So why would a crimeware author utilize ICS naming conventions, ICS Trojanized software, et cetera? Three big points, right? There's, there's a multitude of points, and I don't want to go through those all day, but three big ones. These environments are typically unpatched, right? It's a nice area for malware to go into, especially from a crimeware standpoint. Get into these environments and then propagate and laterally move easily. There's a wealth of boxes to act as quote unquote zombies, right? For a botnet, something else. And it, there was one particular concept that was brought to my attention that was interesting. For, was it for the possible sale of access to that ICS environment to someone else? Maybe there was someone that came to a group and said, create malware, get us into an ICS environment, and we'll pay you X, Y, and Z. I have no attribution or anything else behind that. It was just an interesting uh, concept that may exist. I don't know. What does some of the published metadata look like? So you can see, anybody looking at that, including myself initially, thought that that was valid. The metadata is, is very similar, especially if you do a high level glance. So what were some of the families, or a majority of the families that we saw? A lot of this are going to be familiar to some of you. Um, we have Zeus, Tiny, which is an old school banking, Trojan, banking malware, um, all the way down through Kins, <clears throat> and Andromeda, Jadtree, et cetera. So this is a breakdown. There, I haven't broken down on this what the statistics are for each of the families. That actually comes here. So this is Trojanized samples. This is specifically Advantech. There was 24 total samples, with Zeus accounting for 54%, which isn't necessarily out of the ordinary, right? That doesn't surprise me, because Zeus is extraordinarily common. One of the interesting pieces, however, is Jadtree. Jadtree is a generic dropper. It's traditionally used as a wrapper to be able to throw other uh, malware into. So in this case, started to see a pretty big chunk of Jadtree droppers being submitted and used. For whatever reason, I don't know. What I think is, what my theory is, these particular individuals are testing out the actual droppers that they're using. They're testing it, trying to get it honed to where antivirus is going to have a really hard time picking it up. And then they're going to weaponize it. They're going to go one step further and weaponize it at that point. I haven't seen the weaponization piece of that yet, but this is the most interesting piece in my mind, is looking at those droppers, tracking those droppers, and seeing whenever they weaponize it. That's the interesting part to me. Likewise, for WinCC, there was 32 total samples. And you're going to notice an interesting correlation here as well. You have Zeus being a big one, Citadel being another one, and you can see across the board. I haven't updated this slide, but as of two nights ago, there was also a dump of Jadtree that I was finding with WinCC as well. And the, interest, the other interesting point behind that is those were also submitted from China and Taiwan. So those droppers are becoming more prevalent. They're empty, quote unquote, but there's a high likelihood they will be weaponized, and that's what I'm waiting for, is for that to happen. Hopefully they don't watch this talk. What are some sample file names? So you're going to run through this. I'm not going to go through all of these, but you're going to see, obviously, a lot of these that you're going to recognize. If not, engineers might um, think that it's something valid. Or if you're a security individual and you're in the ICS environment, um, you might look at those and think, oh, OK, that looks valid. The naming convention is valid. I may not know anything about the ICS environment, but those look valid, right? So I'm not going to even touch them. I'm not going to think that there's anything malicious behind them, and I'm just going to leave them alone. So now, the last kind of piece of this is custom malware. And by custom malware, I mean it's malware that I created, um, which is probably highly illegal. I don't know, like the laws behind that. But yeah, so I might get arrested after this too. I don't know. Um, 
so whenever I created this, it mimics Havocs. So I made it to, to, to mimic Havocs, but I made it to the point where it was what I created, to see if it was doable, to see how fast I could do it, and to execute it. It's fully undetectable. Um, it has full rat functionality. And I used Bozok, which is a traditional tool utilized by um, APT actors, and I used the server as my server side because it's super efficient and it's super easy. Like they, they, they did a really good job. Whoever designed Bozok did a good job making a rat. So this is the video of that. What we're going to see here is on the right side is the machine that's actually going to be executing the malware, and on the left side is the server that the malware is communicating to. So the left side, whenever it starts to execute, is going to be who the attacker is. The right side is the victim. So let's go ahead, and you're going to see, first I dump the hash online to generate the hash. So everybody can see that I didn't go out and repurpose a piece of malware that already exists. I wanted proof of that because I know somebody's going to say, well, that hash is already out there. Yeah, no, it's not, because I'm showing you here. And if you want the hash, I can give it to you. So we're going to go through. The hash doesn't exist. And I have Wireshark fired up on the actual victim, right? Obviously, a real victim's not going to have that. I wanted to show you um, the execution of this. So here's the hash, non-existent. If you want to double check me, I can email you the hash or whatever the case is, and I actually dump it into virus total intelligence as well. So I'm taking away any type of talk that might say that this existed. So there's nothing there. One other note to make during this is that this, creating this, took roughly, um, I'd say, two hours to create in total to make it execute and work the way that I wanted was roughly two hours. I probably could have done it faster or someone that was, I don't know, a lot more skilled than me could have done it faster. Ideally, I was going to do this in the live lab, um, but because of the time constraints, I'm, I wasn't able to do that again. After this, if you want, I can pull the lab up here and we can run malware against it all day. I don't care. So here's the actual execution. I didn't bother with going through and changing the icon, anything like that. It's easily done. It takes a, it's trivial. It takes a matter of minutes. So if I wanted to change it and make it look like a valid, um, you know, peak HMI install or whatever, you can easily do that. It doesn't take any time, really. So you can see it execute. You can see the TCP traffic generated. It's going out port 502, Modbus, obviously. So an operator, ideally, if they saw traffic, would just kind of let it go. They wouldn't really pay much attention to it in an ideal world. And then here in just a second, I'm going to switch over to the actual attacker side. And you can actually see it already pop up on the top left. That's the actual server, meaning that now the attacker can go out and execute. I don't know why the video stopped, but either way. On the left side up top, you're going to see how ah. you're going to see the IP on the top left. What that's saying is essentially I have complete control of the system, and that's the equivalent of getting access to the actual RAT server and being able to then execute commands, etc. So, what about defense mechanisms? We all have, and we've all heard all the common defense mechanisms. This was the best one I found, other than the creepy spear fishing bathtub guy. This one was pretty awesome. <laughs> and I, I believe me, I'm not going to stand up here and say, well, the defense mechanisms, you have to patch your stuff. Everybody knows the defense mechanisms, and that's why I put this up here. Um, in all actuality, and I'm not saying this because I work for an AV vendor, having AV fully installed and patched would have caught a lot of this. It would have. Admittedly, it definitely would have. And I'm not saying that because I work for an AV company. However, you know, this stuff is migrating, this stuff is changing, so keep that in mind. Just because it would have been caught to, so, to some degree doesn't mean that it's not going to be continuing. And I know, you know everybody has the AV debate and everybody talks, okay, well, you know, antivirus and control system networks, et cetera, but it would have definitely caught a lot of this, so keep that in mind. So that's it. We blew through a lot in a very short period of time. 
again, um, we can bring the lab up if you want. Whoever wants to do that, we can attack it and do whatever we want. Um, now I will open it up for questions for whoever may have them. Great. Uh, thank you for kicking things off. So uh, we'll take questions from the audience. Um, I think if someone can head back that way, we have a question back there. Also, if you, Rob, I think he, oh yeah, if you can head back there. Uh, if you have a question and you don't want to send it in, you can, or don't want to raise your hand, you can send it to s4question at digitalbond.com and we'll read those off. So please introduce yourself. Am I, am I up? I'm Andrew Ginter with uh, Waterfall Security. Um, you know, back in the day, uh, Stuxnet was able to punch through multiple layers of firewalls. Uh, the first layer out, uh, daisy chaining communications through multiple layers and levels of firewall out to the internet uh, to ultimately reach a command and control center. Mm -hmm. um, did you find evidence of this in these these uh, this malware, or is this something that? relies on a path directly from, you know, routable directly from the, the control system out to the world? Yeah, so I didn't see any advanced um, or complex chaining of communications. It was literally piggybacking on traffic that um, would ideally, to the attacker's mindset, already be open out of the firewall. So port 80, 502, anything that they would perceive as possibly being open in that environment is what they would piggyback on. I wasn't seeing anything that was advanced chaining, anything like that. And that's why I classified it as quote unquote commodity crimeware in a way, because I'm not seeing that advanced piece yet. It may exist and it may come about, but I'm not seeing that yet. We had a question sent in here that the dark reading article claims that there are websites posing as vendor download <laughs> sites. Did you download the counterfeit WinCC files from these fake websites? If not, where did you get these files? Yeah. And so the WinCC files themselves, in one instance, yes, I pulled it from the counterfeit site. In other instances, we had it on our internal intelligence. So Trend, we have a, as you might expect for any antivirus organization, we have a large database of files, intelligence, et cetera, as well as pulling it from there. So both aspects. But there was only one instance off of the quote unquote watering hold site that I pulled that file from. Other questions? We have one over here. Uh, Bill O'Roy. I was just wondering, once it got in the uh, trusted environment, what was, did you see it actually try to uh, do other things but to propagate itself amongst the different ICS equipment, or there was just uh, a dedicated attack? Once it, once it found its way in, it didn't try to uh, segregate, you know, yeah. populate all over the place. Yeah, sure. So um, from, a, from a lateral movement standpoint, on the Trojanized samples, they did not try lateral movement. They did not try to spread. But keep in mind that I ran them for a, not an extended period of time. I kept them running for roughly 24 hours to see if there was any, um, if there was any communication back to the attackers, to any C2s, et cetera. Um, so I didn't see any types of lateral movements. But that's part of an extended study that I'm currently doing as we speak to see what is happening from a further level. Um, unfortunately, this kind of came about not that long ago. So, and it's actually in addition to the slides that came after I'd already completed the entire deck. So it's still kind of in the research function behind that. And, and ideally, I'm gonna be bringing in some outside parties, ICS cert, et cetera, to be able to then start to leverage some of that as well, some of their computing power, et cetera. So does that answer your question, hopefully? Okay, cool. Other questions? You have one over there again? Okay. Yeah. I have one myself. Um, <laughs> I'm Reed Whiteman from Digital Bond Labs. I don't think uh, we've so ever met in person, Reed. Nice What's to meet you, man. Yeah, I don't think we've ever met in person. Um, so there was a Kaspersky report put out about Havex, which indicated a few additional scanner modules, like a DNP3 yeah. scanning module and some other things. Have you seen those modules? Have you uh, evaluated those? <laughs> um, so I've seen a secondary scanning module that's looking for specific ports. Now, is it enumerating the actual protocol? Not that I saw, but I did see scanning specific to only 
um, actual ICS protocols themselves. So it was basically just the equivalent of performing an NMAP, but not enumerating any further. Uh, but I, I have witnessed that, yes. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. You're Kyle, um, did you see any difference in the havocs that was downloaded from the watering holes and the ones that were distributed through spear phishing or the other means? No, no, I didn't see any differences. And that's where attribution starts to kind of play out, right? So you can say, okay, I'm seeing a correlation between the actual watering holes as well as other infection vectors. And you can start to draw a correlation at that point and compare the two samples and say, okay, I know, you know, the, the spear phishing sample has this type of quote unquote fingerprint and the watering hole side has this type of quote unquote fingerprint. And you can start to perform attribution and that's kind of where I started on the attribution side. But to an for, for a short answer, no, no. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. Well, thank you very much, yeah, Kyle. Thank you. That was great.